Susan Eastep. I am the president of the board of the Sustainable Business Council, and I welcome everyone here tonight. We have a great program. I'm really, really excited. Um, I'm going to introduce our guest, and then um, we're going to have a few words from Emma Shea, who is the chairman of our Buy Local uh, campaign committee and now our Eat Local campaign committee. So, um, but let me tell you a little bit about Holly. Holly Greenwood um, is a holistic health educator and a chef, so she definitely puts her talents to work um, at home and in the kitchen. Um, she has a Master's of Science degree in holistic nutrition, native Montanan, woo woo, uh, and owner of Real Cooking, a sustainably operated nutrition business based in Missoula. The services, her services include dietary cooking, cooking instruction classes, nutritional supplemental evaluation, health education programs, computerized diet analysis, which I'm dying to hear about, and custom meal plans. So before Holly comes up and gives our presentation, Emma Shea Vitalis, who is, as I said, our Buy Local, Eat Local campaign committee chair. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emma Shabitadis and I'm the brand new chair of the Buy Local Committee. And I just wanted to say a few words about what's going on with the committee nowadays. You know Christmas is coming up and we are organizing a campaign where we try to encourage community members to buy local. So when you go out shopping, please think local and buy local. We are going to uh, have advertisements all over town, indoor, on buses. Uh, we are going to have Facebook and web page advertising, all kinds of things. One very interesting thing is that we are going to put together a holiday gift idea list where we are going to give ideas what kind of gifts you can find here in Missoula. So we are inviting all local businesses uh, to send uh, some ideas with some pictures to me, and we can put those ideas on the website. All right? So this is going to be very interesting. The next project that we are going to launch pretty soon, we are working on it hard at this point, is the Eat Local campaign, where we are trying to encourage restaurant owners to put local and organic food items on their menu. So we are thinking about uh, digital tools, we are thinking about just simple uh, stamps or stickers on the menu, and this is going to help everybody because people can easily find out who is serving local food here in Missoula. So thank you very much, and I hope you will join the local campaign, buy local campaign, and I hope you are going to spend your money local this year. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what it is. I just know it. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. This is exciting to be in this venue. I'm usually in my office, cramped in with about 20 other people, so it's nice to, to have everyone here. Um, so I first want to thank the SBC for asking me to come speak tonight. This is a very important topic, and uh, it's so important, in fact, that it easily could be an entire week's worth of discussion and a conference. So I've only been given 15 minutes to talk about some major points tonight. So if I talk a little fast, you'll know why. But hopefully we can um, have the, uh, the Q&A session for an opportunity to, to uh, go into a little bit more detail with this sort of stuff. So the first thing I want to do is uh, talk about the definition of food sovereignty. Food sovereignty sounds like a pretty big term, doesn't it? It's quite nebulous. It doesn't have a specific definition, but some of the high points are that it means really the right of the people, the communities, and uh, countries to really define their own agricultural uh, labor, food, and land policies. It encourages practices that are socially, ecologically, economically, and culturally appropriate and unique to a given, uh, a given community. Unique being, of course, the operative word there. Uh, <clears throat> it embraces the right to choose the food that we want to eat and how we want it to be produced. It implies that all uh, people have the right to safe, nutrient-dense foods and, uh, and that they have this in order to be able to sustain themselves. It also seeks to heal the planet so that the planet can then heal us. And it does this by encouraging biodiversity, um, by encouraging sustainability, and environmentally sound practices. So it has quite a bit of it under its belt. <laughs> okay. 
So the risk to food sovereignty. So there are many risks to, to food sovereignty. The main ones that I want to talk about tonight are, number one, big corporations, especially the pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies, which we'll be talking a lot more about. Uh, number two is the FAO, which stands for the Food and Agriculture Organization. It's under the uh, United Nations. Number three is the WHO, which is the World Health Organization. Number four is the U.S. government and other governments worldwide. So our food supplies are driven by big corporations, which I'm sure is not a huge surprise to anybody in this room. Uh, they also are very motivated and only motivated by profits, also not a big surprise to most people in this room. Um, <clears throat> But the problem is that they, these companies are really responsible for uh, changing our agriculture systems to where um, they no longer value healthy, nutrient-dense foods. And it really doesn't value sustainable communities. It really doesn't care anything about that, actually. And it really doesn't care much about people's right to make their own decisions um, of their communities and, um, and their farms. Next is the WHO and the, and, the, uh, and the FAO. So their mission is quite large as well, but the main, their main mission is probably to, uh, to end world hunger. <laughs> no small feat. Yet the policies that, the, that they've established aren't really as sustainable as one would think that they are. Um, they are actually pro-biotechnology. They, and despite their efforts, our global food system is actually still broken. Not a surprise. <laughs> Um, small farmers in the U.S., uh, particularly, and, and really around the world, still cannot afford um, a fair price to what, for what they raise and what they grow. Meanwhile, one billion people in this world are still growing hungry. Then we have our government entities. And uh, in many ways, our government and the governments that are worldwide are really, in my opinion, really overstepping their bounds in a lot of ways. Um, there appears to be a lot more inappropriate regulations of our foods, of our supplements, of our water supplies, and virtually all of our resources that are really needed to sustain us on a daily basis. And look and see what happens when the government does intervene, and uh, look what they've done with nutritional uh, and dietary recommendations. So here in this graph, and I'm sure it's pretty hard to see this, but here we have in 1980, this was when the first USDA food pyramid was established. Look at the increase in obesity as a result of those guidelines and recommendations. That is just one of the many examples that I can give you tonight, but I think this one's pretty powerful. Next. So why are these risks to food sovereignty so important for us to talk about tonight? Well, it directly impacts our health, for, first and foremost. Uh, second of all, it really dramatically uh, affects our nutrient values of our foods and uh, of our supplements. It also really dramatically affects our choices, and this is probably the number one thing that I want to talk about tonight, is our freedom of choice. <clears throat> it contributes to diseases and symptoms, um, things like nutrient deficiencies, autoimmune diseases, inflammatory conditions, digestive disorders, um, and how many people know of anybody who has any of these that I've just talked about? Oh, come on. Everyone's got to know somebody. <laughs> these are pretty, pretty uh, important things that are going on right now. So I want to talk about this in the context of using just one crop as an example, and I'm going to use wheat as an example. So over the last couple of decades, wheat has been hybridized to contain about 40% roughly uh, more gluten than it has in the past than it has in the past 60 years. And it's also genetically modified a lot of times. It's also a huge monoculture crop, um, meaning that it's not going to be as nutritious as it was decades ago. It's also very highly processed, as we know, unless, of course, you're grinding it yourself, which not a lot of people are doing that. Um, and just a few examples of how uh, this one crop, grown unsustainably, I might add, can affect health. The certain peptides that are in wheat <clears throat> actually significantly increase the risk of diabetes, and it does this by producing autoimmune responses that actually can damage the cells that produce insulin in our bodies. Number two, leaky gut syndrome. This is a digestive disorder. It's auto, also an autoimmune condition. And the same thing happens with this condition. Um, basically, it's a result of the ingesting of this certain peptide that we're talking about, um, among many other things. And there's literally millions of people that have this disease. Um, well, it's not really a disease, a condition, I should say. Uh, all over the world, they don't really even know it. It's, it's, um, it's hard to determine. 
So other studies have shown there to be a link between gluten intolerance and multiple sclerosis. Also, the more gluten in the diet, the higher the incidence of schizophrenia. They have, um, several studies have shown that uh, inmates that are in mental, mental, mental institutions, um, when they have removed gluten from their diet, they uh, all of a sudden are able to get off almost half of their meds, if not all of their meds. So it's a pretty, pretty interesting thing what this gluten is doing. Um, another thing is consuming too many omega-6 fatty acids, which are primarily found in grains, versus um, and not getting enough omega-3 fatty acids, which are usually in fish oils and in animals and dairy that where the cows have been grass-fed. Um, this has a really adverse effect on the body as well. It can cause autoimmune conditions and anti-inflammatory and, and conditions. So um, unless the, the two are balanced correctly. We could talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A. Next. So the five specific areas where I feel that food sovereignty are most at risk, I mean, there's, there's literally hundreds that we could talk about tonight, but I'm just going to concentrate on these, on these really important five. The first one is raw milk. The second one is Codex Alimentarius. The third one is the Food Safety and Modernization Act. And the fourth is GMOs. And the fifth is our local water supply. So the first one I want to talk about is raw milk. Um, so in the past few decades, the, the FDA has really um, set out to, to really restrict the sale of unpasteurized raw dairy um, in the United States. And what's interesting is why has this even become a government issue? You know, it comes from a, a cow, for crying out loud, you know? It's not a, not a big deal. Well, what's interesting is that the U.S. dairy industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, currently, there are 35 uh, dairy lobbyists that we have working in Washington. C political campaign con contributions will, were uh, well over five million in the year 2010, and this has doubled since 1998. So the FDA really has a lot of their, you know, they have their political interests to, to protect, and they're really, in my opinion, going to extremes to make that happen. Um, their primary concern, I don't really feel, is that a person is going to fall ill from drinking raw milk, but more it's that they are trying to squelch sort of a grassroots movement that is taking up some serious momentum. Um, and the movement could, could basically threaten the, uh, the dairy industry, and I think that's more where this, uh, this fear is coming from. So just this August, as an example, there was a raid done in a, uh, on a private membership co-op in Venice, California. It was their second raid in a year. And basically, the LA Sheriff's Department, the FDA, the uh, Department of Agriculture, and the CDC, all in uh, <clears throat> carrying guns and SWAT brigade, confiscated and destroyed thousands of dollars worth of yogurt, milk, uh, cream cheese, cheese, all of this, dairy products in general. And they also arrested three people, one of which was my old business partner from California. And this is happening in a state where raw milk is actually legal. Okay? So it's pretty serious stuff. Are there, it's, anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Um, so just for some perspective, the raw unpasteurized milk is truly a whole food. Okay? It comes from small family farms that are practicing sustainably. They, um, they, these cows are allowed to, to, uh, to graze on grass. They're allowed to be outdoors. They are not uh, given antibiotics. They're not giving horm given hormones. Um, they basically are producing milk as Mother Nature intended it to be produced. Raw milk is also known to cure asthma in children. It actually can strengthen the immune system. It has um, the ability to produce a lactic acid bacteria that actually can um, protect against pathogens. So it's really amazing stuff, really amazing stuff. On the other side of the spectrum, we have um, commercial milk that has not been produced sustainably, anything but, in fact. Um, it's pasteurized, pasteurized, it's homogenized. And the pasteurization is the process of heating milk to a specific temperature to kill off bacteria, right? So what's interesting to note, though, is that this process was first used in the 1800s, and it was a temporary solution to producing cleaner milk in a time when sanitation in the uh, urban cities was really, really poor. So instead of cleaning up the milk production techniques, as one would think that you would do, uh, the dairies used pasteurization as a way to basically uh, mask the dirty milk. 
So as milk became more mass produced, then it became much more of a necessity for the large dairies to maintain their profits without really um, sacrificing their productivity. That's basically the bottom line. So as a result, the pasteurization really became, became sort of a standard in the industry. And unfortunately, right now, we have even more and more dirty dairies because of big ag and, and whatnot and the way that these animals are treated. And so consequently, they're having to ultra-pasteurize milk now. So it's just even, it's even more of a dead product than it was before. <laughs> And incidentally, just sort of an aside, those who can't consume pasteurized dairy often can consume raw dairy. And the reason for that is because raw dairy actually has uh, lactase, which is an enzyme, digestive enzyme in it, to be able to digest the milk sugar lactose. So a lot of people that have you know, lactose intolerance and whatnot, this could be uh, possibly a reason for that. And pasteurization process actually destroys that lactase enzyme. So risk number two, Codex Alimentarius. Has anyone heard of this? No? OK. This is actually getting a lot more publicity in the EU than it is here. Um, and the main reason for that is because it actually was originated in the EU. Um, basically, the, Alex, uh, the Codex uh, Alimentarius Commission was uh, started in 1962 with the help of the WHO and the FAO. The goal of the commission really is just to establish standards, guidelines, and recommendations for all of our food and for our supplements, our dietary supplements. And this all sounds pretty harmless until you realize that the commission is heavily sponsored by Big Pharma. And they adopt the use of high fructose corn syrup as part of their food recommendations. Okay? And the recommendations that Codex are making are very much threatening our food security. And we are just now starting to see the tip of the iceberg. Um, in a nutshell, the Codex guidelines have really been proposed to stop consumers from overdosing on nutritional dietary supplements. That is one of the main reasons that they even are in effect. So they are hoping to do this by dictating which nutrients they deem to be safe. They are regulating the minimum and the maximum potencies, potency values on supplements on any given product. And they're also enforcing new labeling, uh, new labeling laws and packaging laws. So some examples of how Codex is already being in uh, effect or how we're already being affected by Codex is in Canada. The possession of DHEA, which is a uh, basically DHEA is a metabolic hormone and uh, people uh, in Canada can now be uh, charged um, with a felony and they can be thrown in jail by having it in their homes. This is DHEA. This is something our bodies make and produce on an ongoing basis. It's to help us modulate stress. It, helps, it works in conjunction with cortisol. It's very, very important for those people with autoimmune conditions, especially MS, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so that's just one of the wonderful things we can look forward to here. And the commission also wants to set ridiculously low potency values on our supplements. So an example of this, uh, or before I say that though, um, what this will do is it'll make it to where supplements become so costly, in fact, as costly as pharmaceutical drugs. So it's gonna make it really hard for people to be able to actually um, buy them. So an example of this is that they really want to take vitamin C and offer it in only 50 milligram tablets or capsules. People need 1,000 to 5,000 milligrams on a daily basis. That's five to, about one to five grams. So to restrict it to 50 milligrams, you can see how that cost is gonna add up pretty dang quickly. Um, many people need supplements for, uh, for pre preventative maintenance. That's why a lot of people are taking them. Um, <clears throat> they also need, in some cases, therapeutic doses of certain nutrients for a very specific amount of time to help with an illness or you know, preventative maintenance again. So if these guidelines are gonna be enforced in the United States like they already are in, in Europe, then we have a, a really, um, we're gonna see a really dramatic increase, decrease in health. We're also gonna see a dramatic increase in diseases. Make no mistake about it. We're also, and it's also gonna take away our personal responsibility to be able to uh, have any say over our own health and our own welfare. So everything is basically gonna be dictated by Codex at some given time, unless we try and stop it. So you also have to consider biochemical individuality when you're talking about this subject because everybody, um, everybody has a unique individual nutrient need uh, for their given body. So if you standardize supplementation, then you're really putting a lot of people at a disservice. 
So Codex passed most of their, some of their regulations in April of 2010, last year. And <clears throat> as we speak right now, the, the Codex delegation is meeting in Germany um, from the 14th to the 18th. And I've been getting uh, blogs, uh, updates from um, Scott Tips, who is a representative of the Freedom Health Act. And he has been saying what's been going on at the, at the delegation. And there's some really interesting things going on right now. They really severely want to limit saturated fat by, uh, to, to be only 10% of our daily uh, intake requirements. And among many other things, so we can get into more detail about that later. So really, the, commission, the Codex Commission really strongly believes that we can get all of our nutrients from food. That's why they're putting all these regulations on supplements, um, not to mention the fact that they've got big pharma backing them. So we can talk in the, in the Q&A about why this is not actually truthful. OK, risk number three. OK, so Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, this, is, uh, this was something that passed in December of last year. It aims to enhance the safety of, poo of the food produced in the United States, as well as that's that what has been imported overseas and also to prevent foodborne illness, food illnesses. And I believe that this is probably the most dangerous bill that the, uh, in the history of the United States. Yeah, this, uh, it is basically to our food what the bailout was to our economy in a lot of ways. So it really expands the regulatory powers of the FDA. It puts all of the US food and farms into, uh, under Homeland Security and the Department of Defense. Oh, is that? <laughs> and, uh, and basically, the Tester Hagen Amendment that we've all thought was our savior is really not as protective to the small scale farmers like we thought it was. And again, we can go into more detail later about this. Um, so, the main issue of this that I believe is that, uh, you know, if, if farmers are selling directly to consumers, then there, you know, is a relationship there. People know they're farmers. They're going to ensure that there's safety, that there's quality, that there's accountability, that there's transparency, all of these things which are really important. But you have the ability then to talk directly to your farmer and say, hey, what's going on here? You know, we don't need to have you know, more regulations to, to be able to do this for us. So I think uh, really just cleaning up the big ag industry in a lot of ways is, is the solution. Um, you know, raise animals and, and plant crops the way Mother Nature intended. It's sort of a no-brainer in a way. Okay, risk number four, GMOs. Holy cow, this could be a huge topic. So really the most uh, frightening and the most uh, controversial, probably, threat to food sovereignty is the case of GMOs. And um, this technology really refers to the manipulation of an organism's D uh, DNA genes. <clears throat> and it alters the structure and the characteristics of the genes. And the two traits that are most often bred in GMO crops are for uh, herbicide uh, tolerance and insect resistance. And we'll talk about how that's not even happening. But the main problems with the biotechnology as I see it are, number one, that the, uh, the cross-pollination and contamination of the crops and the ability to just basically destruct our uh, natural habitats. Number two is when a biotech company alters a seed's DNA, it, it really creates unique traits. And those traits then are, <clears throat> are considered intellectual property. So farmers are really um, obligated to dispose of their seeds um, after they harvest. And if they don't, then they actually face legal repercussions for this. GMO seeds are not fertile. So, um, and because they're patented, they have to be purchased every year. Uh, in order to be planted. So it forces farmers to really be dependent on uh, GMO manufacturers. And what this does is it pulls our world's food supply into the hands of these biotech corporations. And honestly, I mean, whoever controls the seed controls our food supply. So this is a very, very, very big, big topic. Uh, number three, the loss of heirloom seed varieties is another problem with it. And number four, to date, only two independent peer-reviewed studies have been done on the, uh, on the safety of GMOs. All other studies that have been done have been financed directly or indirectly by the biotech companies themselves. Number five are health problems that are related to GMOs. And there are so many uh, examples we can talk about here. And I'm, again, I'm going to save that for the end. Number six, the unpredictable effects of genetic manipulation. So gene guns are used to insert genes into a host DNA, right? 
So the process is sort of like taking a gun and taking it to the, to the shooting range and having target practice. It's literally hit or miss. It's not an exact science at all. So it has really unpredictable consequences. Um, the genes may be inserted the wrong way. They may, they may be uh, multiple copies may be made or they may be duplicated. It may switch the gene off or on depending on what has happened and this is a very unexpected sort of situation. They also can have the, uh, the genome kind of hop around unexpectedly. So there's a lot of weird things that can happen and the result of this is more viruses, more cancers, more allergies, okay? So it has the ability to turn off genes that were at one point sleeping, so, and it can do, and vice versa. So it's a, it's a very dangerous uh, sort of uh, situation we're playing around with here. The other problem is with the genetic splicing is that it can actually change the shape and <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, organization of the protein. So any protein that is incorrectly folded or or structured can actually duplicate itself and what happens with this is that it actually has the ability to cause infectious neurological diseases. This is exactly what happened with the mad cow disease. Lastly, scientists are taking uh, the DNA from one species and they're transferring it to a completely different kind of other species. They have taken, um, for example, they've taken Arctic flounder which is uh, resistant to freezing temperatures and it, they've inserted the gene into a, uh, into a tomato's DNA um, so that the plant would basically not have the ability to die off from frost. So this new antifreeze gene has never occurred in a tomato before, which means that future offspring is going to have it, and we absolutely have no idea what the ramifications are going to be from this. And this is happening with strawberries and fish. They've, do, they've done strawberries and fish. They've done tobacco and cotton. They've done, I mean, just some weird, weird uh, sort of, uh, combinations. So slide number nine. Okay, so our last one, risk number five, is water. So this is another area where our food sovereignty is really being uh, threatened, and this is happening on a local level. So our publicly owned water utility, uh, Mountain Water, has the, um, has the potential to be sold to the Carlisle Group, which is a global, uh, giant, privately owned corporation. And Susan Stubblefield is here tonight. Raise your hand. And she's, um, she's representing Missoula Water now, and she actually has a petition for people to sign if they're interested. So that's pretty much it. Um, so the next thing is pretty much what do we do about this? So I'd like to open up the floor for discussion and, um, and to talk about how we can change how we think about food, how we grow food, and what we're willing to spend on food, which I think is a huge part of this discussion. Um, and just this discussion that, you know, cheap food, as Michael Pollan says, cheap food is an illusion and we will pay with it with our health. So let's talk about some, some solutions to this. Now, yeah. did you have a question? Is, the, is it not the case that the um, sale of uh, the mountain water is completed? Or is it still part of the discussion uh, <coughs> as to whether or not it will go through? Maybe that should be uh, addressed to you. Please stand so we can hear you. Okay. Um, Park Water has entered into agreement with Carlisle, right. and Park Water owns our water utility and two other utilities. Um, however, citizens in Missoula urged the Public Service Commission to assume jurisdiction over the sale and the Public, uh, Public Service Commission is going to be probably making a decision uh, before the end of the year. So the mayor uh, and the Clark Fork Coalition entered into negotiations with Carlisle and they have put together a letter agreement and since then there's also been a stipulations agreement. Um, I'm part of Missoula Water now and my big concern, and I think a lot of people's concern, is that this letter agreement is not a legally binding document. There can be so many things that could happen. Uh, the mayor negotiated with Mr. Dove. Mr. Dove may be gone. Um, if Carlisle buys low, adds value, and sells high, so would we even be able to uh, competitively bid on our water utility? 
And would that added value be, in fact, to take care of our infrastructure, which is in bad shape right now? <coughs> or would it just simply be raising our rates, which are already some of the highest in the state? And uh, so we would look attractive to someone else, uh, another entity. And just quickly, the mayor said, well, there's probably not that many uh, companies that are going to be interested in buying a utility. Not true. Water is becoming the hot new investment item. So, so does that answer? It does. Thank yeah. you. I, I, and I, I do know the current status. Yeah, and I do have petitions, and I'd be happy Great. to let Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so let's have some discussion about all these juicy topics that we threw out tonight. Yes. Um, what about? Um, passing some kind of local food security policy or act that could possibly address a whole range of the things you've talked about. Are there any other real local communities? I mean, do we have our, the ability to do something that, that goes against um, national standards like pasture, pasteurization, for instance? I think we do on a state level, certainly. Um, it just hasn't had any success so far. Um, you know, there's certain states that are that are trying to uh, to um, get that passed right now and aren't aren't necessarily successful. Um, I don't know. I mean, let's let's talk about it. I don't I don't know as though I'm I'm certainly not an expert on this subject, but I don't know if, if we do have the ability to trump national, you know, law. Um, that's a great question. Yeah. I know the state of Vermont has been pretty active um, in trying to protect their food and there have been um, cities throughout the U.S. that have passed ordinances about GMOs, that they would not allow GMOs. Now, it's a great idea how effective that actually is. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Do you have any thoughts? There are cities that have uh, instated food sovereignty acts in their own cities as well as states that are trying to adopt the same thing. Um, you know, typically when a federal law or act comes up, the state has to at least regulate that or a higher standard of regulation, not below. Um, and I understand that we could adopt something like that on a local level, but there's no real um, legal Binding to an agreement like that, it would be basically be that we would commence some standards and that we would adopt a certain way of being, you know, we could be a fair trade city, we could be a non-GMO city, we could be a food sovereignty city. Um, but does that mean that everybody has to abide by that? So, you know, there are some standards that we could look at, but you have to understand as well that a lot of people, even in the local foods and ag movement, believe that food safety is an important issue. Um, but I want to have the choice. You want to have the choice. And right now our choices are being pretty much put to the side. Yeah, and that's that's really what it boils down to. It's got to be about freedom of choice. That what's you know what's good for me is not necessarily good for you, but it's just that choice that I have to make that decision. You know, do I want to consume raw milk because I know that it's healthier for me? Why can't I do that? It comes from a cow for crying out loud. You know what I mean? Like I should be able to have that right, and I shouldn't have to have the government tell me that that's not something that I can do. You know, there's the part of the Codex Alimentarius that I didn't talk about was the NAS, NAIS um, part of it, which hasn't been enacted, but I'm sure it's, it's quick to, um, basically, which, you know, is our national, um, uh, is our uh, way of identifying every animal that's on a farm or even in the backyard of a house. Yeah, and it hasn't passed, but if Codex gets our way, it will with no problem. So there's so many levels to this that I didn't even touch upon tonight because I only had 15 minutes, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues there. Yeah. Uh, this is so, sort of uh, connected. Uh, 35 years ago, uh, after I retired, I, I worked for a few months with an agricultural firm down in Phoenix. I was there for four or five return developments, but uh, uh, they said, their officials, that if it wasn't for herbicides, fertilizers, so forth and so on, 
uh, playing to the fields throughout the world, we starved to death. Uh, has that changed in the last 35 years? <laughs> I mean, that, that's contrary to what you're pushing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh gosh, how much time do I have to discuss that issue? I basically that was a huge part of my master's thesis was this idea of um, of really following food and evolution and seeing where the uh, the problems have arisen with uh, ways that we're we're looking at agriculture, and uh, so that's a that's a huge topic. Um, I would argue to say that is not is not the uh, the um, solution by any means. Um, I mean, look what happened in World War I and World War II, where they, they encouraged almost every family to, to um, have victory gardens, you know, where uh, I think they said that uh, a fourth of the United States uh, um, uh, produce was being uh, produced by those victory gardens. I mean, if, if we all just looked at our available resources, you know, went together with other people, neighbors, communities, things like that, we, there's an amazing amount of things that we can do that we do not have to be reliant on herbicides and pesticides and you know all these big ag sort of solutions. There's so many other ways to, to consider it. So. Well, organic farming has increased tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, this young fellow here has been working several years uh, on an organic farm in upstate New York. And uh, it, uh, you feel as though that has helped uh, uh, form a balance uh, by encouraging more organic farming? By, yeah, hoping us not have to use so much of those. Oh, certainly, uh, yeah. Well, I think a lot of it, too, is just education. I think it's just educating people that we can actually do this in an economical, you know, an ecological friendly way, um, sustainable way. There, there are so many different solutions. And, and the problem, I, just to read some, um, I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but I just want to read some statistics here, which I thought were really scary. Um, that has to do with that very topic. It basically, statistics from the USDA show that current agriculture practices, so we're talking big ag here, reportedly destroys approximately six pounds of topsoil for each pound of food that is produced. The United States farmlands are losing topsoil 18 to 80 times faster than the rate at which soil can be built as a result of humus and, and, um, and minerals being depleted and not replaced. Worldwide, only 42 to 64 years worth of topsoil remains. Pretty scary statistics. Pretty How scary. many Orientals uh, for Sorry? farm? Simply, they've been farming the same land for a thousand years. China. Mm. They're building their soil. Mm -hmm. They're not putting pesticides and herbicides on it. Yeah, I mean, if you just... Yeah, if you just look at a, at a um, permaculture way of, of doing agriculture, I mean, those, the solutions are right there. You know, you're constantly re, uh, pl replacing the soil with the minerals that have been lost. You're constantly doing co you know, you're cover cropping, you're, you're rotating, you're, you know, crops. You're, there's so many different things you can do. So I don't believe that this is the end of our solution right now. I'm just asking these questions to, to bring out to your Discussion, absolutely. It's great discussion. That's why we're here. Yeah, in the green. Um, I just had a question about, um, I'm a member of the SBC, and I'm just wondering from an education standpoint, um, how do you view this as, what can we do? Like, what can SBC do? What can members of the Missoula community do to help support your cause and continue the education efforts? Gosh, there's so many things. Um, I mean, I put a couple of things here. I've got a resource handout in the back that has a lot of different uh, websites that you can just um, continue to look at and, and see the, you know, the ch what's going on with policy in, in the United States and in the world. Um, I think everything does start at a grassroots level, so I think the more we talk about this, the more education we provide, the more interest we get for really uh, people understanding the just the magnitude of some of these problems. I mean, the fact that what three people raise their hand to know about codex, that is that's a sin, <laughs> you know. And it's not there. It's not everyone's fault here. It's like we're just not the media isn't covering it, you know. So we have to do our own homework and we have to really do our own investigating. And uh, but by having forums such as these where we're you know planting the seeds, I think is a, is a wonderful way. Um, also, you know, one thing is you know we can really affect change with our pocketbooks. You know, choose not to buy foods that are GMO. Choose not to go to stores that have these big ag sort of products, you know. Really go to the go to co-ops, go to buying, you know, start buying clubs or go to, you know, local buying clubs. Do things like that that encourage those types of, of um, 
of practices. You know, if, if people stop, stop buying high things with high fructose corn syrup, they're not going to be making it anymore because they don't have a market for it, you know? So that's really where we have to affect change is by, is by our choices and what we're, what we're willing to buy and spend for our food. Yes, mother. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, eventually what we're going to have to do is go to our legislature, probably. Yes. To, I mean, not okay. probably, yes. but in order to change the laws. Mm -hmm. Okay, right now the climate is not right for that, I don't think. But we do have a senator, John Tester, who is an organic wheat farmer. He's got a lot of other things on his plate right now that probably are going to take priority, but eventually we may use him as a resource and, and some other people to help change these, these laws. Mm -hmm. And that's eventually what we're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and Black just kind of following up on that tester's amendment, seemed like it was a good compromise on that Food Modernization and Safety Act. Mm -hmm. um, but with salmonella outbreaks, E. coli, and a lot of the things that are taking headlines right now, how do we help to regulate big ag, if not by policies, you know, a sweeping huge policy that then can maybe be tiered down for small farmers? Um, what do we as you know, citizens and champions of local food do to help regulate some of that big ag and, and deal with some of those major issues of health. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a huge question because, I mean, we literally have got to, I don't even know how this is possible, but to force them to change some of their practices, you know, because of the way that they're practicing is causing us to have to put in things like the Food Modernization and Safety Act, you know, so it just, it's, um, it's very, it's a very complicated thing, I think. Um, but one uh, kind of an aside on that is just recent, actually just today, we got wind of um, Organic Pastures Raw Dairy in California uh, was just asked to um, recall all of their dairy products. And this is probably the largest raw, raw milk uh, dairy in the, in the United States. And um, what's interesting about this is that they're claiming that five children got sick from E. coli from drinking raw milk. But what is interesting is that when they actually went to, uh, to test the milk, they found that there, it was negative for pathogens. So it's interesting. So this is another big part of this whole idea is just this grassroots movement and getting people aware of the, of the problems and really being journalists and really questioning what they're reading in the media. Because, you know, someone gets a hold of this and says, oh, well, raw milk, it's caused five people to be hospitalized by E. coli. Well, yeah, okay, that, those are the facts as, as they see them there. But then doing a little bit more groundwork to actually call the dairy and go, well, what's going on here? And then that's where you find out, oh, it actually, the test actually came back negative. But is the CDC reporting that? No, it's only reporting the fact that five children got hospitalized by E. coli. You know what I mean? So it really, I think, um, and just for your reference, 1,300 people were um, in California were sick from pasteurized milk in just the year 2006. But that never gets reported, <laughs> of course. So it's only the things that the government deems as, you know, as uh, unhealthy or, or wants to sort of, um, you know, uh, create some ambiguity around that, that we ever hear of this. So. Anyway, so that's just one example of just, you know, I think the major part of this is just really diving in and asking good questions, being our own journalists, and doing our own research, and not just taking every single thing that we see from the media as verbatim. And a perfect example of this is in my newsletter, this last newsletter that I did, I talked about, um, about vitamin E and that huge study that was done on vitamin E and <clears throat> how the New York Times and the Washington Post, all these major media outlets came out to say that vitamin E is no longer healthy for us and that it actually encourages diseases, not prevents diseases. Well, what we've, if you actually do the research on the vitamin E, you find out that the, the type of vitamin E that was used in the study was a synthetic vitamin E from petroleum products and it wasn't using the entire vitamin E complex which, of which there's eight tox, uh, to, uh, tocotrienols and tocopherols. So that's a huge part of how vitamin E is so wonderful is because it uses all of those different elements. It's not just one isolated nutrient. So again, just people not doing their homework. So all of a sudden, vitamin E's got this bad rap, <laughs> you know, so. Don't believe everything you read in Google. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> Case in point, yes, exactly. You had another? Maybe what we need to do is find some uh, media people who are um, interested in, in what we're talking about mm -hmm. and uh, get them to do some work for us. That's a great idea. And educate. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to throw out a term to everybody, and that is food sovereignty. Joe Ellen was talking about what do we do to mitigate big ag and their um, this food modernization act. We don't have to spend all of our dollars with big ag. Why do we have to think about big ag? Yes, they surround us because they're in the grocery store. What would happen if you spent 50% of your food budget on local or regional foods? What would happen to not only our economy, our health, the land in this region? I mean, maybe we need to start thinking, you know, fully globally all the time. And like, let's think about Western Montana and Central Montana and what really feeds us as a people. What do we do about this thing that is bigger than us? Well, first of all, we have to educate people. People have to get passionate about the issue. And then we can change policy. I can't go and try to change policy if I don't have anybody behind me. We can't have a big conversation with the legislature if nobody understands the issues. So by Holly being here and contributing all of these resources is, is just a step in that direction. What we need is momentum. What we need are people saying, I want to buy the foods and I want to buy the supplements that I want to buy because I'm the person who gets to dictate what I eat and what my, is good for my family. That's where we have to start. We can't, we can't start at the legislature by one, two, or three people. And you have to make the choices. You have to educate yourself. Raw milk is about economy, pure and simple. It's a choice, but it's about economy. If you talk to people who are farming and who are producing milk, it is a huge piece of economy for their family. Do the history, like do the research in our history as a country. The Boston Commons held the cows. That's where our economy came from. And we either get back to that, or we're gonna be reliant on Big Eye. Quite frankly, that's where we're gonna be. So it's like, get up, Start using your pocketbook, start doing the education, and start really putting your money where your mouth is. Or you're going to be eating Big A from now till eternity. Or till you end up in the hospital. Until I was going to say, your lifespan would probably be shortened quite substantially. <laughs> yeah, you had a question? I was just going to make a comment, which is I think it's really exciting that there is such a proliferation of farmers markets, and that's really a nationwide yep. movement, yep. and that the natural and whole foods market is growing at 17%, and traditional foods are actually losing market share. Mm -hmm. This is a professor, but so those statistics are very encouraging to me. Yep. And also, just as a final comment, um, Folks from my parents' generation, they were born in 1915 and 1918. The idea of corporate egg never existed to them, and herbicides and pesticides were a non-issue. Everybody lived off a of sustainable egg yeah. 60 years ago, yeah. and granted, our population has burgeoned. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm finding that even people in my life that aren't necessarily cognizant of sustainable lifestyles are very interested in what they're putting in their bodies because of mad cow disease and because of you know, E. coli and these outbreaks, and it's even getting the ear of folks that normally might not pay attention to things like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm very hopeful. Well, and you, you picked up on something when you said that um, the two, the farmer's market movement and the whole foods movement, I mean, both of those, look where they started. You know, they started off small, but that's the whole point of all of this is that we can make a difference. It is a grassroots effort, but grassroots efforts, you know, have the ability to, to, to sustain a, a dramatic momentum if we all just band together. And I think that that's where we're heading. Um, I don't think they're going to get away with this is my gut feeling. I mean, it's a huge, huge problem. But um, as Kristen said, it doesn't have to, we don't have to be thinking of it on a global scale. We can be, th we, as long as we're just thinking about it on a local scale, that's what matters. And I think that's what breaks it down to smaller components where we actually can get our heads around it and where we actually feel like we can actually make a difference is if we actually start, you know, putting it, just breaking it down into the smallest components possible, then all of a sudden it becomes manageable. All of a sudden it becomes doable. All of a sudden it's like, oh wow, we actually can make a difference with this right now. And there's so many wonderful local community resources that we have here that um, I, I really think that Missoula has got a shot. <laughs> and Montana too for that matter. So it's, I think it's encouraging on a lot of levels, despite the doom and gloom of my presentation. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Um, I just wanted to share an example to continue with your wheat uh, topic. Um, one way in which I've heard, I just recently learned, I, I worked on an organic wheat and dry bean farm, so mm -hmm. um, a young lady that was doing postdoc research at the Cornell School shared this with us because she wanted to work with us. Um, wheat, this, so wheat was not only bred for higher yield, stall, you know, shorter stalks that were strong, all those things, but was also bred to have longer gluten chains that could tolerate these industrial sized mixers. Mm -hmm. So it was actually bred for the industry and not for human health. There's a very exactly. specific way yes. in which it was done that. Yep. And it's being theorized, not proven yet, that those longer gluten chains have provoked a lot of the mm -hmm. gluten intolerance in people. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Um, yep. And then I had a question also. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then I'll what, how's the best way to eat local in winter in Missoula? Oh, what a <laughs> fabulous question. See, this is so hard for me because I was born and raised here up until 18 years of age, and then I went to California where I was for the last 16. And so I'm just back now for about two years, it's been about, and uh, I'm still having a struggle with that because I, was, I had a farmer's market available to me twice a week all through the year yeah. in California. It was awesome. So. Um, a lot of food preparation and storage techniques, I think, need to be taught. I think that is also, um, so I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to indirectly sort of give you some, some background, is I think one of our main problems is that we've lost our connection to food. Nobody knows how to grow it. Nobody knows how to cook it. Nobody knows anything about it. And I think that is a huge problem right now, is that there's a very limited amount of people that are willing to spend time in the kitchen are willing to spend time to actually go grocery shopping and looking for the best produce that they possibly can, um, or sourcing their produce, finding out what the resources are around them that are available to them to be able to get the most uh, abundant nutrients in their foods. So I think that's a huge problem right there. So we need to sort of fix that issue so that we can then help the issue that you just addressed, which is, you know, like I know Kristen, she spends, what, like at least a couple of days, if not a week, canning tomatoes. You know, she buys boxes of tomatoes for her family and she has a canning tomato party. And then, you know, there's other things that, that she does for her family. She has four kids and, and a husband. Um, so there's, there's other things that we can do like that, just this, this thinking and pre-planning of ways that we can prepare for the winter. You know, and yeah, is it, it's not ideal. We're not actually getting fresh, you know, fresh from, from the vine that day, but it's pretty, it's pretty close. Which naturally you wouldn't in winter. Exactly. And that's the other thing is, is, is really thinking seasonably too. Season, seasonality is a huge factor of that. You know, we, I, I, looked, I went to the good food store uh, two days ago and there's asparagus. It's like, really? Yeah, it's so November, and we're supposed to be buying asparagus. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. And it, like, stuff like that just drives me crazy yeah. because it's not what we're supposed to be seeing on our shelves, but we're so used to convenience, and we're so used to, you know, having everything at our disposable at every given point in time. It's just, it's ridiculous. So I think we've been spoiled. Yeah. You know, we're spoiled by convenience. We're spoiled by so many different things that are really affecting what we're willing to do. If we just are willing to spend a little bit of time in the kitchen. I mean, I work, I've got my own business. I'm busy, I work 12 hour days a lot of times, but yet that still doesn't, doesn't make me you know, go home and throw a TV dinner in the microwave. A, I don't own a microwave, but if I did, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. You know, It's like, how long does it take to actually put some, it's, anyway, I won't go into details about my meals, but um, <laughs> you know, it's an easy, it's a, it's a 10 minute dinner solution that's totally healthy, totally sustainable, totally organic, and makes me feel great and gives me energy. Yeah. So you know, there's things you can do. I don't want to hear people complaining about, I don't have time to cook, I don't have time to do this. It's like, make time. It's your health. If we don't have health, what do we have? We have nothing. It doesn't matter how much money we make. It doesn't matter what car we're driving, what kind of house we own. Nothing matters. Only our health, because that's what's going to sustain us. So, question. Yes. I was just curious what your perspective was on the, the growing farm to school movement and how that really introduces elementary age to college age students to local food. Um, I also think it might tie into an awareness of seasonality and more of a, 
a connection to those rhythms and what is available at different times of the year. But I wasn't sure if it was an overly optimistic take on my part that it it was becoming more of the norm or really spreading like wildfire. Or what do you think is the the national presence of these farm to school movements? Is it making enough of a dent to shift the consciousness of this next generation? I think it is. I think just like anything, any movement we've been talking about, it absolutely has that potential. It, you know, any, any great movement has to start small. And so far, just in the past five years, I mean, we've seen the farm to school movement really, really grow, mostly in part to Alice Waters and, you know, some of her book, the edible schoolyard book that she published and, and just her take on all of this. But, I mean, Wisconsin is a huge state that's doing that. Um, a lot of school cafeterias are changing their foods to all organic or, you know, doing a farm to school program. I, I think it's, it's wonderful and I think it will definitely take, I think it will definitely grow as the years go down. Yeah, for sure. I know what women did long ago. My wife was born here in Missoula in 1917. And they can't. They didn't they get can't. oranges. They didn't get pears. They didn't get those things. But she looked up good age. Mm -hmm. Thanks yep. to her ingenuity and substituting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There are ways. Where there's a will, there's a way. Well, I think if we have one more question in the room, then we should take that. And, you know, Holly, you've been just tremendous. Has anybody got a, another you know, sort of wrap-up kind of question? And there it is, Ryan. Ryan, it's up to the plate. <laughs> hey, Holly, is there any country anywhere that this is being done right, where they've got full choice, that everything's really clicking, that we can use as a model you know, I used to think that there were, and then I found out that Monsanto has basically impermeated vir virtually every country in, this, in the world. <laughs> so I don't know as though there is, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's other, I know there's smaller communities that are doing it, but as far as country, I'm looking, because I want to move there. <laughs> I don't know if there are. Yes? Um, I'm from Uzbekistan, and before I came to the United States, I did not hear a lot about what you just said. Because there are no corporations um, owning everything. It's all locally grown, um, locally um, made. And a lot of people don't even know about the problems you guys discuss. <laughs> Where did you say you were from? Uzbekistan. And I would say, like, a lot of developing countries probably don't face it as much as people do in the United States here. Um, and another thing is that it's all seasonal. You know, you don't find tomatoes in winter exactly. unless they came from another country. Yep. And they're super expensive and nobody buys them and yep. there's no market for that. Yep. So um, for countries, you know, go to, go to cheap, cheap or developing countries and um, eat fresh food from your neighbors. So, so maybe you're our model country. <laughs> so I have a, a comment too. If we're if there's more questions, um, I've got a shopping guide that um, I have a sample of in the back of the room here. It's a guide that I did that sort of. Um, it sort of encompasses everything we talked about tonight. It's um, a list of all the, the healthiest foods that we can have or that we are able to find here locally and, um, and where you can find them at what stores. So, and also the resources in the back of the book um, on local buying clubs that uh, Kristen uh, manages that you may not know about um, called the Heirloom Project and other resources like that. So I sell them for 15 bucks. If you want some, I have some here. I've also got newsletters back there um, if you want them. I've got an email sign up news, uh, newsletter um, uh, sign up sheet if you want to be on my mailing list. And I also have some literature back there on, um, for, from the Weston Price Foundation, which is basically how I got involved in this whole movement. And they are an amazing organization, just so rich with education and activism. And they are doing such a tremendous job with all the issues that we are talking about tonight. So I highly encourage you to look at the handout. Um, that has their website address or look at some of the pamphlets they have in the back there. Kristen and I are both co-chapter leaders of the Weston Price Foundation here locally. There's quite a few dispersed throughout the state and we really encourage you to know more about them and we can certainly talk to you about, um, about the organization if you're interested. So. Well, I think we should all thank Holly. This is like <laughs> Thank you.
everybody. But many years ago, and you're not all as old as we are, as I am. But Arlo Guthrie says that if there's just one of you, then they think you're nuts. And if there's two of you, they think you're gay. But if there's three of you, it becomes a movement. That is the basic premise under which we all need to operate. Let's make the movement go forward.